hi it's uh writing wednesday and uh i'm janet fitch and i do these every week to answer your questions about uh fiction writing and uh, the quarantine has been uh, heavily on everybody's mind some people are writing some people are having trouble writing put several new videos up on my YouTube channel um, where it's easier to uh, look through and find the, the writing Wednesday that you've been looking for. Um, so I have been writing. I've been um, working on this new novel uh, and it's really coming along. Uh, the whole thing about being in this lockdown situation is that having a project that I can say, you know, in six months, I can be fairly far along in this, which is not my usual pace because I'm usually like living a complete life. But this way, right now, I can, I can uh, have a limited time. And we've talked about that, you know, how I use a timer, this group that I'm working with, we, open a room and we're on a timer. We work for 25 minutes, take a break for five, do four of those, half hour lunch, four more. And um, having, there's something about that limited time. So if we figure this lockdown, or it might not be a, you know, enforced lockdown, but definitely probably staying off the streets a little more than usual, uh, curtailing our, hey Sayward, hope you're well too. Um, curtailing activities um, give, definitely gives you time to put into your work. And if you think of it as a, this is going to be a little intermission in regular life, can I use that in an intensive way? Crazy energy. I don't know. I, I wrote a, an article recently on Shondaland. Um, that some of you have seen, uh, you know, just about writing in these times and taking all that crazy and all that imagination and all that firepower that's bouncing around your head like a pinball game and see if you can get it out of the circularity of those thoughts and into a more focused and get some movement, not just this movement, but you know, get some movement out of it. Um, hey, it's Zudade. See, now I got you. Uh, good to see you. It's, um, you know, how to get a some forward movement out of all that crazy pinball uh, thinking that's going on. So if you're interested in Shondaland, uh, and it's about writing, dancing with the unknown, which is what we do every time we start doing this. I had to start a new chapter of this book that I'm working on yesterday. No idea what came next. No idea. Sat down, made a list of things that I could write about. Hi, Gail. Uh, things that I could write about and just started writing and gradually the tenor and tone of what I was going to be writing on emerged. So a lot of writing, as was, you know, talked about in that article, um, a lot of writing is trusting that there is stuff in the air, there's stuff, the unseen. If you sit down and start to work, that the universe meets you, the unseen meets you. It's like people sourdough bread, sourdough starter, and you know, it's flour and water, and then whatever is in the air is unseen and reacts with the flour and water and gives you something that rises up. Oh, okay, Daisha's worried about uh, writing two similar stories. Okay, because I'm work. I will be answering questions, so I will take a look at that problem. Um, so right now I am doing a lot of, a lot of writing. Just, it's like 11 o'clock, it's time to go, go to work. Um, I'm not 
as a writer, you know, I don't have that timetable normally. So it's good. It's good, you know, even making a date with a friend to say, okay, we're, we're both going to get together at such and such a call time, I'll call you, and we're going to work for an hour or two hours. And you can keep the phone, you know, phone line occupied, or you can just call again, you know, after the hour is over, either way. Stephen, I have I have talked about your book so much. It is such a pleasure that you're dropping in. Hi, Jill. Um, I am very um, very happy to have be having something to chew on because if I don't have a project to chew on, I go crazy. Uh, I'm I was saying I'm like that beaver. You know, if I'm not constantly chewing, my teeth get very long and start digging in. So. Uh, it's better to chew on um, writing than it is to chew on myself. Um, so Shondaland is on Shondaland.com, and uh, it's called uh, Writing in Time of Uncertainty, something like that. But the actual title is uh, Dancing with the Unknown, which is what you're doing. Um, so today I wanted to talk a little bit, of, if you have questions, just go ahead and pop them in and I'll be answering your questions. Uh, today, I wanted to um, address a couple questions that have already come up during the week. Uh, Sylvia um, asked a question, Janet, would you please address on Writing Wednesday what to do if um, when you're writing you, you, uh, you tend to fall asleep whenever you write? Um, my ex-husband used to call this writer lepsy. And what happens is when you are not hooked in to the live liveness of the writing, you just, it's hard. Writing is hard and it's, you know, I do this too. You get sleepy and uh, unlike, you know, the nine to five job where you have to st sit there at the desk, and whether you're sleepy or not, three o'clock, you know, you can't really crawl under the desk and sleep, which is what I always wanted to do when I was a manpower temp. Um, doesn't hurt to take a nap. Resets the, the um, all the synapses, gets all the little, uh, little receptors happy again. And sometimes a little nap but if you tend to sleep too long, Sylvia says, I nap too long and lose precious writing time. Time it. Set your timer for 20 minutes. Give yourself a schnooze. Come back. You will feel refreshed. So I, there's nothing against taking a nap. Just don't think you're going to, you know, don't let it go on for a couple of hours. Uh, you completely lost your day for sure. But 20 minutes, you'll feel better. But the writer lepsy is when, you know, it's just like, I can't figure this out and I'm getting sleepier and I can't figure this out, I'm getting sleepier. Um, often taking another tack, trying something else, working on a different scene or a different part of the scene, or just to say to yourself, I'm just, I'm just going to experiment with this. I don't have to keep it if it doesn't work out. Make a list of the possibilities and pick one. And see what see what you do with it. There's a, I um, studied qigong for a long time, and there was a in Tai Chi, and there's a Tai Chi master who was kind of kind of out there guy, and he had written a book. And one of the things about the book that I really liked was the about not knowing, and it's one of the his principles that you cannot know the experience before the experience. You have to actually have the experience to know the experience. And the problem with, you know, many of us, myself included, is we want to know before we do it. You know, is this going to work out? Is this going to be worth it? Is this going to, you know? And the truth is you can't know, have the experience without having the experience. You cannot know what it's going to be. So I sat there yesterday in front of my, my, blank screen of chapter 13 yeah and then you know it's not that kind of a novel where i'm following some detective around you know and even 
even in a detective novel, you have to, you ha will have a chapter, the next chapter is like, what the hell am I going to do with this? And, you know, handle it lightly, you know, don't, don't go in thinking you should know. Okay, get rid of that. Trust that there is stuff in the air. You're already cooking with it. You're all, it's already, you know, you've got the flour, you got the water, or in my case, I think of, you know, just getting in my canoe and going out into the unknown. But the unknown also meets you. There's going to be a dance going on. So you have to go get in the canoe and shove off from shore for anything to happen. But things will start to cook. Thing, little particles will come in from the air, call them idea, idea viruses or whatever. You know, these little things, they're in the air. And they're, it's like why your compost isn't just garbage and newspaper, you know. It becomes this living thing because there's stuff in the air. So trust that something, that, that there is stuff in the air that if you start cooking, it's going to get in there. And what do you know? a complete scene yet I have you know I but I've written what it is I wanted to say is in there now I have to figure out the scene which is a there's a change that goes on oh the art spirit is just fabulous and Stephen Nachmanovich's book should be on that shelf with the art spirit it's exactly your little short shelf of life save life saving writing books um I find it hard to plot, uh, love the idea of the unknown. It's always a dance. So even if you do plot, you know, hold that very lightly. Uh, my colleague Les Plesko used to say, uh, beloved friend, uh, colleague, uh, inspiration, used to say, don't have ideas. Well, good luck writing without ideas, you know. But what he meant was, you know, you're always going to have ideas, but hold them very lightly. So if you plot, hold that lightly because something more exciting might probably will happen while you're working. So even people who do plot, you know, need to be open to what is actually going to start breathing. Something you didn't plant, something else might be growing in there that is more authentic and it's coming out right out of the material um, and not being imposed on you. Then you'll find that a, a lot better. The Somebody wrote to me, was it Jeffrey? Uh, are, Jeffrey, are you with us today? Uh, I think it was Jeffrey, um, wrote and asked about second person. Uh, the use of second person. And second person, as you know, can be singular or plural, right? There's you, 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 you know, anybody who's had a good lecture, a good talking to knows what you is like. Um, there's a couple of different uses. Um, you, when, when the book begins to talk to you, the reader, um, First of all, you're probably getting the authorial voice like you in the 19th century, 18th century, dear reader, you blah, 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 you know, um, that is the author stepping outside and talking directly to the reader. It's an interesting move. So there's one for your bag of tricks. The writer can speak directly to the reader, but you is also pretty insistent. You know, it, it reminds me sometimes of, um, of panhandlers. Uh, I remember being in San Francisco once and they had to have an anti-aggressive panhandler uh, ordinance in San Francisco because for some reason the panhandlers there were uh, would like grab you. Um, and that's also what how the second person can singular can affect the reader. It can feel like you got it me, you know, and then I'm grabbing you by the lapels and you know, you want to go <laughs> step away from the car. <laughs> so be aware that there's an irritation factor there. It's a very aggressive, I mean, in a very subtle way, but it is an aggressive voice. 
you this is what you need to know this is how you bet behave this is you know um it's also a um it's a plea for understanding um when i say i you know i go down the street it's that's pretty neutral and it's very attached to the person who is speaking the i character you in is like involving the reader. It wants the reader to come in and tell, you know, uh, tell you what it's all about. Um, when I'm in therapy, if you've ever been in therapy, no, of course you haven't. <laughs> Only crazy writers. No, that's not true. Of course, um, they always tell you not to say you. They say say I, which means owning it. You, you know, it's like this and you do this and you do this. And no, you, I say, I do this. I do that. Um, there's a wonderful book by Samantha Dunn called Failing Paris. It was her first book. And it does a really interesting uh, thing with the second person. It's half, it's written half in the first, half in the second. And the first book, person it's a girl in Paris big send-off uh, she won you know like the local rotary prize and is sent off to Paris uh, for school and uh, college and um, Paris turns out to be a real bust and she can't go home because she can't admit that she has screwed it up right so failing Paris and it's a very interesting um, when she talks about the past, the, when the protagonist talks about the past in this book, she refers to I, you know, and I did this and I did that and we did this and my mother did this. But when she talks about Paris in uh, the present, it's all written in the second person. And you do this and you do that. And here's how you you know, go to the abortionist Paris. And this is how you, you know, how your lover treats you in Paris. So it's like, it's a plea. It's a, it's like saying, be, you walk in my shoes for a minute, see what it's like. But it's also distancing the way therapists don't want you to distance. Uh, it's putting her experience at a certain remove as a way of controlling it and also it's a plea for the reader you need to you've got to understand you've got to walk a mile in my shoes so there is second person then there is second person plural and second person plural is like a chorus right if you've ever uh read uh, and then they came to the end by joshua ferris uh it's a it's an office so the we is the people in the office. Um, there's a very effective use of the second person plural in a um, in a novel I read this year called um, Oh, I hate to to let you down of what it was called. The secrets we kept. And it's about um, the CIA in the 50s in Washington. And there are a group of women in the pool. And the whole novel is not narrated by that group of type women in the typing pool. There are uh, other point of view characters who were women in the typing pool or who are working for the CIA. Um, but every chapter or two, I think we started with we, um, you get the perspective of this group of women in the typing pool and their opinions about everyone and everything and what's going on. And that's like the Greek chorus. That's a, a, a community opinion, a community view. Uh, so you, it's like you're getting the background for the um, actual uh, kind of foreground characters. You see 
the world that they are dealing with, the background noise, in a way that, um, oh, it was extremely effectively done. And I recommend you take a look at that book. So here we have a question from, and I'll get, there we go, from Daisha, your question about, uh, I worry that I am writing two similar stories. Yeah, I have a short story collection that you'd read one of the stories, maybe in another magazine or journal, and really liked it, and then you read the collection, and you go, oh my god, these are the same people. It's the same people. Usually it's not necessarily the same story, but it'll be like the same it's, you know, she's Charlotte in this one, and she's Rochelle in this one, and she's, you know, Burgundy in this one, but it's all the same person. So if you're worried that you're writing too many similar stories, consider that you're not checking out different protagonists. The, you know, if you're tend to write people who are like you, um, realize that there's no one you. There's a multitude of yous right now. Um, so it, it's like in a dream, if you could think of this, in a dream, everyone is you. I mean, your shrink would say everyone is you. Well, what we do in dreams is take parts of ourselves that are at war and we give all of those characteristics to a certain figure. And then this figure deals with this figure and you start to be able to figure out who you are, what's going on. So perhaps you're not using the whole, you're not separating issues. You're not separating the parts into different characters. So if anyway, you're writing two similar stories you know, the first thing might be to diversify protagonists, age, occupation, city, you know, religion, ethnicity, philosophy of life, the, kind of the degree of energy or lack of energy in the physical body, um, uh, different disabilities, different issues, different problems. On the other hand, um, maybe you're, you vary the character, but the situations all seem the same. Well, that's not bad. Think about a, a um, short story collection where every story takes place at this university. That's not bad. So location isn't the problem, generally speaking. Uh, if the stories are similar thematically, you know, you're working some out. You know, they said Picasso only painted five pictures. <laughs> you know, he painted the bullfight. He painted women who were pissed off at him or women who were sleeping. Women, you know, women, the bullfight. Was there anything else? Animals. <laughs> You know, he didn't, he didn't have a huge range. It didn't matter because he brought, he, he brought com complete freedom and originality to the thing that he was working on. So I would say allow things to happen that you don't expect. If there is something that you would normally do, like you're a, working on a scene and you'd say, you know, do the family feud thing, you know. Uh, 98 out of 100 people would say this character is right now, is about to do X, do Y, make an interesting turn, take an interesting turn, take an unexpected turn. Um, think of the thing that you would, that is the most common thing to do and then don't do it. Think of the most common thing that that character would say in that situation and then don't do it. Do something else. That's another way to start unlocking uh, different stories. You know, uh, you could say I write a lot of mother-daughter stories. There's a lot of mothers and daughters in my books. Um, but 
in the course of human events, everyone had a mother and half of humanity has been a daughter. You know, I mean, that's like, what, 3.5 billion people? So those are enough dissimilar stories within a great theme. So I wouldn't worry about that too much. But if people are saying this is basically the same story that you wrote last time, or you're feeling it, try diversifying the protagonist, try a different issue. You know, it doesn't all have to be um, jealousy if every story seems to be about jealousy. You know, try a different emotion, a different theme. Uh, you can try a different location that you know well, or a different location. You know, if you want to do all stories set in, say, um, you know, the Miracle Mile in L.A., if you're, all your stories are set in the Miracle Mile and you kind of like that, you want that cohesion, make sure to show a different aspect of that location. Don't always make it the same places, the same people. Look at Ring Lardner's books or short stories. He's the, the guy, Dot Guys and Dolls was based on Ring Lardner stories. And he wrote stories for 30 years about Broadway and Broadway type of people but all different, all different. You know, something different happens in them. So that might help. What else do we have today? Uh, yeah, Tony says, I tell myself all the time I'm going to try this for fun. That's, it has to be fun. Even in the editing, even in the editing phase of your book, you can crack it open and do something else, do something original, do something fun with it. Um, and definitely read The Art Spirit. That is wonderful. Um, let's see. What else can I... Um, yeah, plot is very difficult for me. Um, but I always have my little compass. And the compass is like where... What is the overall issue that I'm dealing with here? And make sure that you're... Kind of following that, that you know, dim light, you know, or little light lighthouse uh, way in the distance. I have a lighthouse here somewhere. I should. Um, then something I else I wanted to share that I came across this week was um, I'm reading John Le Carre. Sometimes I just have to read John Le Carre. Uh, he is such a marvelous storyteller, marvelous writer. Uh, the great novel, The Perfect Spy. If you've never read it, read it. I mean, it's to me, it's up there with Dostoevsky. Uh, the brilliance of his characterization, the motivations. The it's the semi autobiographical one. Um, he talks about his con man father and stuff. Now, here's a question. Do you have suggestions for endings on short stories? Uh, is change in the internal conflict the character enough? Okay, I will, I will do that. Okay, uh, but first I want to talk about John Le Carre. I'm reading uh, The Spy Who Came In From The Cold, which is a very early John Le Carre. And I just wanted to share something that he does. And maybe I'll do a whole writing Wednesday about this because it's worth making a, a big point about it. He is such an amazing, um, such an amazing writer. And I want to show you what you can do with a gesture. I have written and talked about dialogue, that the biggest amount of dialogue, dialogue is like a Sunday, right? And you have the ice cream and you have the hot fudge, you know, and the bananas and the whipped cream and the, all that. And then you have the nuts on top. And the proportion of utterance to everything else that goes on in a dialogue scene that continues, the, what goes on in the person's head and what they see and the landscape and uh, all the sense elements, you know, this is all, it, it completes a dialogue scene and gesture people forget that when you are having a conversation with somebody who doesn't speak English if anybody's had that experience 
uh, you're in a country where nobody speaks your language, and you can still be understood because gesture, tone of voice, expression are carry like most of the information. And what we do with our lips is not is a very small part of it. And I just wanted to show what, what uh, John le Carré does with a gesture. Oh, it's so brilliant. So the spy who came in from the cold, Lemus, who is actually going to go back into the cold, but he comes in for a brief conversation with Control, so the head of uh, MI, MI5, MI6, whatever it was back then in the 50s. And you have Control, and he's sort of a crotchety old guy. And he's, you know, he's wandering around. He's, where's that girl? You know, going to have some coffee. Control crossed to the door, opened it, and talked to some unseen girl in the outer room. As he returned, he said, I really think we ought to get rid of him if we can manage it. This is more the, the opposite character in the spy game. Why? That's Lemus. Why? Nothing left in East Germany. Nothing at all. You just said so. Remick was the last. We've nothing to protect. He's trying to send him back out. Why? Control sat down and looked at his hands a while. That is not altogether true, he said finally. But I don't think I need to bore you with the details. Oh my God. Oh, somebody's just, Gail's just watched the movie. Okay, but what makes that gesture so wonderful where he looks He's like, why would you want me to go back out there when everybody's dead? Which is like the big question that's being begged. And control does not answer. Control, he look, and, and look at the time. Look at his control of the time. Because he sat down and looked at his hands for a while. That's how you do a silence. You don't just say, he was silent. So boring. No, he does something that takes a little time. He looked at his hands for a while. And then he says, that is not altogether true. So he's had time to really think about it. So you're paying attention to the next thing he says. He said, finally. But I don't think I need to bore you with the details. Oh my God, the urgent question, the silence. If anybody has ever taken acting classes, they say that uh, the person who controls the silence controls the scene. And so dialogue doesn't have to go back and forth like playing ping pong. Sometimes the character will grab the ball and just sit there with it. Now they've just taken control of the scene. So he's asked a very pointed question of control, and control grabbed that silence. And he did it by with a gesture. He, it, he sat down and looked at his hands for a while. So if you're doing a dialogue scene this week, try to get a silence in there. Get somebody to control the silence. Don't answer the question. Do something else and give us a gesture instead. And then the person speaks. So if you look on the YouTube or down here, you'll see um, uh, a couple of videos about dialogue and you'll see a little bit more about this subject. Okay, so now we have the question. Social distance cinema is rising fiercely. Dramatic scenarios between two or more people interacting over a mobile device. That's cool. Um, will that be... our? Do you feel that will be the underlying reason for our fascination with these forms, aside from the obvious reason? I think it's just, uh, you know, one person, drama is one person pressing up against another person. So, you know, you can do it by phone, you can do it in any way. So it's just part of our lives. So we had a really good question here um, that I wanted to get to, Wendy's question. Uh, do you have suggestions on endings for short stories? Mine have been falling flat lately. Is a change in the internal conflict enough for the character enough? Well, I have a whole uh, video um, on beginnings and endings. So t check that one out, Wendy. But I would like to address this right now. 
endings in a short in the short story are the most fragile things the most it is very you know it is a one of the more challenging aspects of fiction writing is finding a good ending for especially for a short story because short stories can be so wildly innovative so what makes for a good ending i tend i'm a novelist so i i tend to use a hammer for all things <laughs> i am you know i want to nail that sucker down and that's you know that's not what the best short story writers do so if i'm writing short stories i have to be very careful and people who do wonderful endings um it's often not a big hammer blow. It's often a very quiet, like saying, oh, and then you have to go, oh, that, that was it. That's the ending. And then the story, it, it makes you stop and let the story sink in a little deep so that you decide um, what they, you know, you let it, you know, it's like digesting, it's like eating something that's very cold and, you know, it has to come down into the body. Um, generally, they don't have real ending ones, that's passe. So I think that some people believe that a, my teacher, Kate Braverman, used to think, say that a, a short story is the curtains can just open and you get a look at the mystery and then they close. So the closure of curtains is a very quiet thing, you know? Um, it doesn't have to be, you know, I reeled and I reeled out into the darkness, you know? It, it, the dramatic ending to short story is not really what you're looking for. Um, you're looking for something that closes a door and opens another door. So you don't want the finale as, you know, it's not, oh, Henry, you know, you want a story that, an ending that closes, but also opens the possibility of the next thing. So you don't have to say what the next thing would be, but just, you know, there, there needs to be like a little lift, like almost doing calligraphy and you do your final flourish. There's a little lift at the end um, that suggests lo that life continues. Um, even if it's like some bird that fall, you know, lands on the dead body and, you know, takes a, you know, takes something out of its pocket and flies away. There's a little lift, you know. Um, some books that I can recommend. See, I can recommend short story books, people who do really good things, because in something so fragile and idiosyncratic as a short story, there there are not going to be rules, not for good short stories. There are not going to be rules because the short story is such a an idiosyncratic form and people can do such amazing things with them. But I would recommend some recent short story collections that I've read that just have been fabulous. Um, uh, there's a book called a a Always Happy Hour by Mary Miller. There's a book called uh, In the Dark Dark by Samantha Hunt. There's a book by Olivia Clare called World. There's a Lauren Groff's Florida. Um, I just read a, a just brand new Steve DeJarnat's uh, Grace After Grace just came out. Um, look at these at, you know, these kind of masterful short stories and write down when you finish them, write down what, how did they end it? How, what did they do to make that? Did they make it pop? Did they quietly close the door? Is there that, that close and that open again? Um, I don't like a story like, many of the New Yorker stories kind of fly up into the trees at the end and leave me going, what? So for me, there's a fine line between that that subtle ending and the non-ending. Um, 
So uh, it's going to be, you have to be the scientist. You have to you have to be the lab guy who who uh, or, or woman who uh, takes the takes a look at those stories and asks herself what is going on how does this work how did that ending work uh, really examine it really explore it um, all right what else I am at your disposal today yeah, it closes the drawstring on the bag. Well, especially, that's a novel ending, especially. You know, I hate a novel that doesn't have a real ending. You know, I close the close the drawstring. Okay, here's Megan. Uh, my biggest challenge with dialogue scenes isn't the dialogue, it's the activity. Yeah. You have to remember that the, the actual spoken word is the smallest percentage of the dialogue scene that everything else the world does not stop and people emit dialogue the world continues people think you know your point of view character has to be active and it's more important what they're thinking than what they're saying often what they're thinking and saying con contrast you know what a hunk of horseshit why, thank you, Mrs. Smith, you know, and the contrast is, is interesting. The point of view character has to be active and notice things. If they're not mentally active, they're not going to do you any good. They have to notice things, gesture, facial expression, tone of voice should be very vivid. Uh, and you'll find the more that the more that you have them um, doing, thinking, noticing, the more, where's the light coming from? What's the weather? What's the time of day? What's the time of year? Um, what, what comes forward in the picture that you're creating uh, and what drops back? In a silence, what do you hear? You know? Um, Far sounds, close sounds, you know, all of the other tools of fiction writing uh, apply. And when you are looking for gestures, uh, I, I recommend to my students and to you and to anybody who will listen to me to keep notebooks. And let's see if I can find my... I have notebooks, you know, that have sections like this, you know, they're divided as sections. So sounds, smells, m physical material, plants, etc. But the biggest ones are portraits and landscapes. And I, let's see if I can find one. And the other, the important thing is so that you have them, you do the work, and then when you're writing, you can pull your notebook off the shelf and say, I need a good gesture. I need a good gesture. I need that notebook. Okay, which notebook is it? I'll do this one. Uh, anyway, I have a notebook that's got uh, landscape and portraits and as part of portraits when I give myself an assignment or an exercise and I finish it then I put I print it out and I put it in that notebook and a very good um, assignment for anybody who is in this situation like Megan is to um, watch TV watch TV and notice, like watch a talk show, watch a, you know, Talking Heads, you know, watch Colbert, watch something like, you know, late night TV. Notice how people are sitting, where their weight is, how they're crossing their legs, are they forward, are they back, and also gestures. What What's an impatient gesture? What's a, an aggressive gesture? Watch movies and stop, stop the movie 
and get your note get your laptop or a piece of paper and describe the gesture in that scene forward it stop it again write those gestures and when you have them you will use them for years and years and years so develop an encyclopedia of your own investigations into expression um, into uh, ge gesture all you will use it all the time when you're uh, at a meeting you know god i used to do this when i taught at usc and we were in faculty meetings and i could sit there oh my god i could sit there all day and describe how everybody was sitting and what they were doing with their hands you know and were they forward were they backwards were they do they um some people have a tick they have these unconscious soothing mechanisms uh that um you can i mean they're they drive you crazy when you're teaching uh I, i've had students who've been twirlers you know usually they're drummers and they twirl they twirl their pen and i've had to say you know look i'm i'm sort of on the spectrum and um I, all i can see is you're twirling can you do that out of you know can you sit somewhere else that i don't have to see you do it um because i can't i can't focus i it, the gesture catches my attention but the twirler i would give that to someone you know somebody sitting there pe the peeling the beer label you know um th there's a look at this what is this you know gestures with two you know with two fingers the other's curled uh, oh, they have a, you know, arthritic bump on their hand, um, the flinging the hand outwards, you know, the, I mean, how would you describe this? How would you describe this as opposed to this, as opposed to this, as opposed to this, you know, you, you know, grab that information. God, I'm still looking. Okay, this is going to drive me crazy until I find it. Um, but anyway, I have a list that is single space, probably at least a couple of pages of gestures just by watching movies, stopping them and noticing and describing the gestures, describing how people are sitting, um, how they stand in a doorway. Um, because unless you um, exercise that muscle, you won't have the content when it's time to write that. You know, you'll know, oh, we need to grab that silence. We need to control that silence. But how do you do it? You, you hear something, you know, what do you mean by that? A car went by with no muffler they could hear it fading away I mean, so it gives you time you can you structure that silence that way um but gestures are wonderful and people do the most amazing things unfortunately we can't sit in a coffee house or in a in a uh, faculty meeting right now and watch what people are doing you know but people do so many things they bite their nails they bite their nails in different ways um and then so you do a page or two of, of um, gestures. Maybe we'll talk about gesture next week. And then do a couple of pages of, um, of facial expressions. You know, how do people look when they are listening and they don't believe a word you say? What do they do? Um, what does somebody do when they're shocked? You know, watch a movie and stop the movie and describe those facial expressions. Also, voices. Gather voices. Like, listen to people. The newscasters are great because they just go on and on. And ask yourself, can I, could I describe that voice to someone? You know, I have pages of that. Um, so a lot of it is doing the research. This is something that um, when I was in college, uh, we there was something called dry labbing. You were in a 
people who were taking lab courses, chemistry, biology, et cetera, et cetera, um, would be given experiments to conduct. And when the person didn't do the experiment, but wrote it up as if they had done it, it was called dry labbing, which mean, meant everything stayed dry because they didn't actually do the experiment. This is the kind of thing you have to actually do and experience to get it into you, to look for these things and to use them in your writing. Um, yes, so at least you noticed that it felt flat. So you, you feel the need for it and um, including all of the senses, everything you're hearing, seeing, and that's why the notebooks are so valuable because it trains you to listen. It trains you to touch things and have reactions and notice how people move. I mean, that's going to be a hard one in physical reality, but it's something you can certainly do watching movies. Um, <laughs> the muffin scene. <laughs> Are you sort of on the spectrum? Uh, not really. I, but I am very sensitive, as many writers are, I'm very sensitive to sound, like the little barking dogs will drive me crazy, and I think many writers are like that. We're just very sensitive. I'm very sensitive when I see this little repetitive movement, when I'm trying to concentrate, uh, it drives me crazy. Um, <laughs> so let's see what else I can do. Well, this has been a very interesting, wide-ranging Writer's uh, Wednesday, and I am, uh, uh, I'll probably be doing um, a gesture next time, talk more deeply about who's doing what. And I love this idea of you interacting with social distance. It's going to be the name of the game, and we that's why that's the way we live. And you know, there's only so much you can smack your head against it. Um, at some point, you uh, go, Well, let's be more curious, let's be more open and uh, accepting what is. So, thank you very much. Don't go, you know, I hope that things go well for you, and um, and be patient. Be patient with yourself. Be patient with the times. Be patient with your work. Uh, there's the, the unseen is also at play here. All right. Well, have a good week.